Hello, everyone. This is Edward Tamesian. I am now the vice president of Internet Infidels, and I am also their social media manager. And I have a library piece that was published by them on The Origin of Evil, and I'm on their kiosk editorial review committee as well. And today I'm going to be interviewing the legendary He Man Meta. Hi. And I, yes. Thank you for being on, sir. And sure. we're going to cover some uh, brief topics today. And the first one is going to be about problems with the Noah's Ark story. So just tell me what you think is the main problems with the story about the animals and, you know, the whole deal of the hyper evolution of the animals, uh, you know, yeah. that before the Ark. So feel free to give me your words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my experience with the Noah's Ark story is, uh, is not so much the let's point out every logical flaw, but I've been to uh, outside Ark Encounter. I've been to the Creation Museum and I see how they talk about those things at those sites. And it's almost comical how they're they're so invested in the idea that it must be literally true. And they spend all these millions of dollars trying to explain how the waste system worked and how which um <laughs> illustrations of noah's arcs are myths but ours is accurate and how they try to account for well no there weren't big animals there were types of animals that sure they evolved later but that's different from evolution i mean the amount of pretzel logic that they got to use to twist everything in there um and the whole thing is you have to believe every version of what they're saying yeah. because their entire notion of christianity is built on the idea that Noah's Ark is literally true. Yeah. So the idea that they ha they couldn't possibly fit every type of species, two of every one, on the Ark, they can't handle that. They have to make up a reason why, no, not all species were on there, just different types of species. Um, and how do you uh, evolve like all these families based on a family of like eight people from mm -hmm. there? Um, none of that makes sense. How did they, where did the boat land? How come there's no proof of the boat landing on whatever Mount Ararat, Ararat, whatever? Like, I, I find it comical. Not that you can't poke holes in the Noah's Ark story. Uh, Ricky Gervais does a great bit of just mocking the story itself in one of his stand-up specials. But it's the idea that you have to believe answers in Genesis's version of the story Otherwise, the whole religion falls apart in their minds. Yeah. And so it's just one of those stories that I always I'm always amused when Christians say it has to be literally true, because not all Christians say that. But it's always just amusing to see them try to wrap their mind around how like, no, of course, that's a story. But the Jesus stuff is literally true. And watching them yeah. try to deal with all I, that. I always wondered, like, how they would get clean a clean source of drinking water, because it's like, yeah. you know, I think uh, Kent Hovind's son was talking with R and Ron. Kent Hovind's son was like, uh, well, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and then he was like, well, uh, that doesn't help explain how they had enough drinking water that was clean enough for a year. And then he was like, right. well, there's plenty of, well, there, there's only one other source, like the, the ocean, but the ocean has all its bacteria and all that. And right, salt you have to filter all like. of it. So, like, I mean, like, what would they, I, what would they, what do you think they would say to that? Like, they just have, like, a beaker or whatever and purified it or, or what? Like, how? Yeah, I, I think that's what their, their argument is in Ark Encounter, that they found a way to purify all the water that they needed. I mean, it's the same way they say they stored all this food to last the length of the flood. Um, and they try to pretend like it's good food that would last for 40 days, yeah, that they so had a way to store it, that they found a way to take care of the animals without slaughtering the animals because you need them to reproduce later on. Yeah, I mean, where are you going to get the ice? It's not like you had refrigerators in 2500 <laughs> BC. <laughs> right, right. And of course, there's no actual record of a giant flood of that magnitude. And if you do the physics of it, could that much rain have poured down all at once? None of it, none of it makes sense. But again, the whole mythology is not about making sense. It's trying to explain stuff without using the scientific explanations that we know because mm -hmm. they just can't allow that to be an answer. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So that, yeah, that was some good information. And yeah. And like, um, Arn Raw was telling me like the initial, uh, story, um, was in that the Noah's Ark story was based on had to do with a flood, but it was like a local flood and had to, it had to do with right. like a guy, like kind of making like a, 
kind of like a boat like contraption and stuff like that and that the the uh noah's ark story is kind of an embellishment upon that like all the flood like the sumerian right. myth and all that it's kind of like they're all like variations on, on that initial event that was a real event but it like wasn't a it's, global event it is so much of those early genesis stories which is it's like folklore that gets yeah, spread yeah. from one group to another group yeah. And at some point, they went from telling these stories to try to explain things they didn't know to codifying it and saying, no, 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 this is what happened, and you have to believe it. Um, so this giant game of telephone just kind of stops, and they say, nope, this is the final version, boom. And now if you question that version, it's like you're the bad guy, you know? Yeah, 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 I know. That's like, it, it's, it, it, yeah, you know, that's interesting. Yeah, all right. So, I, I would also point yeah, out, like, ahead. the things you said, R and Rob pointing out that stuff, the, the pa number of papers and, and articles that have been written debunking all the Noah's Ark stuff. And you could say that about the Jesus story. You could say that about the Adam and Eve. The thing is, the people who promote creationist ministries they don't grapple with any of those papers. They're not trying to respond to those things. They're only promote like it's very much they live in a bubble where they could promote their form of justification. Actually, here's a fun game for any of your listeners. Answers in Genesis has a research journal, like Answers Research Journal, that they say, look, we have our own peer-reviewed scientific journal. But if you read the papers, it's either all jargon that is meant to be confusing so no one can understand it so you assume the person who wrote it knows what they're talking about or it's just laughably bad where they are like putting in math equations that a middle schooler could do um it doesn't pass as actual research but by saying no 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 we have our own version of it we have our phds here yeah but they're phds who don't actually work in those fields or who are known as scholars in those fields um, they just try to promote the air of authority. They don't actually have the science to back it up. They don't have the proof to back it up. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, that was good information about that. And like uh, another thing is, uh, and a lot of um, young Earth creationists make this error. They assume that um, they always want to assume that evolution automatically includes the theory of abiogenesis but it's like as you know the right. evolutionists have pointed out darwin wasn't concerned with the origin of life like whether we came right. from god or whether they came from you know polymers and amino acids that turned into single cell you know f uh, forms that could self-replicate and then build up you know it's not about the origin of life so it's like, right. you know, that's like that's a whole separate topic because, you know, you'll have like Ken Hoban saying, well, like, you know, you evolutionists believe we all came from Iraq and stuff like that and, right. you know, and stuff like that. And I'd also like to point out that they're kind of making a false dilemma with the origin of life. They're saying it either has to be abiogenesis or God did it. But there's actually right. a third option. You could say that the, the, the very first material or the very first um, forms – that existed included forms that were already living organisms that could self-replicate. I mean, if something's there for eternity, it could have been non-life, it could have been life, or it could have been God. So it's not like you're just limited between abiogenesis and God did it, you know? What do you think and, about and that? And again, if all of that's fine, um, there are plenty of good theories. I actually, Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The Ancestor's Tale, where he discussed a lot of those possibilities. But you're right, Darwin concerned himself with things he could prove. Things yeah. that there was an, a fossil record for. Yeah. And yeah. all the subsequent observations have confirmed the underlying basis of the theory. But I would I would actually go back for a second and just say this for the creationists, for the apologists who are like, you have to under you have to explain where life came from because it's either God or we came from nothing or a rock or whatever. Like what what is it that they were looking for? If we could find a way to prove in a lab, for example, that life came from nothing theoretic like to use for lack of better words there like what are they going to do are they going to change their mind or I, I mean i can't imagine they're going to be like oh if you could prove life came about in a lab like even the basic building blocks of life what are they going to do stop believing in god are they going to ditch their faith because if the answer is no they're just wasting your time they want you to provide an answer for something we don't have a definitive answer for and by saying, well, I don't have a perfect answer, I don't have proof of exactly how it happened, they're hoping to say, see, I'm right, God did it, and et cetera, et cetera. 
So, like, that's part of why I just hate those questions from the other side, because they're not interested in the answer. They're interested in using I don't know as a weapon against people because their whole thing, the whole thing about creationists, about religious apologists, is that they claim to have all these answers. And the honest people are saying, well, no, here's what we know happened. Here's what there's proof of. Here's stuff we don't know. And by admitting there's stuff we don't know, they're using that to say, like, see, it must be God. They just don't want to admit it. <laughs> yeah, God like, did it. That's the game they're playing. Using my toast, God did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, so, so I hate I'll, that's yeah. part of why I hate playing those games with them. That's part of why I don't do debates myself. It's mm-hmm. part of why I didn't like at first that Bill Nye was debating Ken Ham mm-hmm. because. That's the game they play. If Bill Nye says, I don't know how this came about, Ken Ham is going to use that for his gullible audience yeah, and yeah. say, he doesn't have the answer. Yeah, I have fuck? the answer. Yeah, yeah. You know? There yeah. must be a God, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, and it's like, but I'm kind of glad he did the debate because, like, it kind of showed uh, how uh, less biased Bill Nye was because, like, the question <laughs> the moderator was asked to both of them, and the question was, uh, what would it take for you to be convinced – that, you know, your view is wrong. And Bill and I was like, oh, well, you know, if we had this evidence or we had that evidence, right. that would be good evidence that, you know, uh, the, you know, the Noah's Ark story is historical. And then Ken Ham was just like, oh, well, it's all historical science. Like, there's way, no nothing. way of back in time. Nothing. He didn't say, well, if I had this evidence from the past and that evidence from the past, right. then I at least believe that the Noah's Ark story, you know, is false. You know, so at least like Bill Nye was more open to admitting, you know, things. So that just showed that, you know, yeah. who had and the less Ken Ham said. Debate. Ken Ham said nothing would change my mind because his whole thing is accepting the Bible as fact and nothing will shake him on that. And and you're right that ultimately after the debate happened and years after the debate happened, yeah. I have met people. I have met people who said that was the thing that they watched that changed their mind about God. They used to believe, then they saw how bad Ken Ham was and it started them on the road to exploring this stuff. So I... I was surprised by that. I understand that, uh, even though I still am not a fan of those debates. But, you know, sometimes it takes those conversations and those debates to to get people who might be stubborn to change their minds on these things. So there is value to it. Yeah, awesome. All righty. Well, thanks for giving me that information. And then to close off, I was going to talk about one more talk of it uh, that was covered in my published paper that was published by Internet Infidels about two uh, years ago. And it had to do with the origin of evil and theistic hard determinism. But I'm going to kind of take it a notch above it and just talk about basically – basically the concept of libertarian freedom and a determinism because a lot of people are like well you know if everything is determined and we do actions though willingly but of necessity like how are people responsible and uh just to give some comments on that um it's not absolutely certain that we know whether we have libertarian freedom or not because think about it like you're presented with options and then let's just say you choose um you know someone says like you know you're in the kitchen and uh, you see dirty dishes and that's just like what did you do that day and they're like well i decided to clean the dishes and they were like uh and then they ask you know well how come you didn't want to clean the dishes and then you say something like well the desire to clean the dishes was stronger than the desire not to clean the dishes you know and stuff like that so then they'll say like uh, a hard determinist might say so you're saying that the reason you chose to do action X instead of action Y is because action X pleased you more. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's the truth. And it's just like um, – and that kind of goes into the theory of um, that the – strong, like you, you have multiple motives, but the strongest motivation you have determines your will. In other words, you have to – you willingly give into it, but you have to necessarily do it. And a libertarian free willer will say, well, you know, some things are determined, like your motivations, they come from your nature. You don't determine to be because in order to choose, you have to be inclined to choose and you don't choose to be inclined. So they'll say, well, you have a bunch of inclinations. You have you need a motive to choose, but you don't have to go off of your strongest motive. You could have willed otherwise and gone off of your lesser motive, hence self-determination. The greatest desire to doesn't determine the will. The will determines the will. And so there's like the debate on that. And it's like um, 
there was, there was a, a Calvinist Christian scholar named John Gershner that kind of showed, uh, gave a proof that libertarian free will was bunk. And I kind of noticed it in my life, too. Uh, let me, I'll give it to you and see uh, what you think about it. So, like, uh, let's just say um, you're trying to see whether determinism is true or not. So you're like, you know what? Okay, I have all these desires, and here's my strongest desire, and here's my low, my lowest desire. Let's just say one of your lowest desires was like uh, getting a knife and, and stabbing yourself just so you can prove you could go off of your lowest motivation and disprove determinism, right? But then here's the catch. The idea of disproving determinism will become so great that through no fault of your own, mm -hmm. the idea itself will excite you so much to stab yourself so you can disprove determinism. And then right before you do the action, the stabbing yourself will actually become your greatest motivation. You see, it's like it's kind of like a, 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 a like a paradox kind of because it's like it's it, what I'm trying to get at is it doesn't seem like it's possible to ever go off of a desire other than your greatest desire. Like it's like, oh, shoot, it's just the die. It wasn't my lowest motive. It became my greatest motive because the idea of disproving determinism was so great. Dang it. And so it's like, like no matter how you try to do things to go off of a desire that's not your highest desire, it's just going to it's just going to end up becoming your highest desire either because you want to like want to disprove determinism or because of some other factor. And if that is the truth, then that would prove that you do actions of necessity so i mean it's an interesting thing it's like what, what do you think about all that <laughs> i i have no idea what to add to that i mean it's an interesting philosophical thing to think about uh -huh. um and i'll be honest with you the weird thing is in all the years i've talked about um religious liberty religious freedom all those issues as they relate the people who are pushing for those things they never ever bring up these arguments or talk about the philosophical nature of free will as justification for the things they do. Uh -huh. So like my take on this has always been pretty much like it's a fine conversation. It's an interesting thought experiment to go through all that. But mm -hmm. ultimately, the people who make decisions are guided by something very different than those things. I just I literally had an interview last week where someone asked me a very similar question and as if that was the reason people were pushing for certain legislation that was uh -huh. like Christian nationalism and it's like that's not why they're doing it. They're doing it for ulterior motives because they want to they're theocrats, whatever you want to say about it. But again, it's one of those there this is part of why I stay away from debates about God too. Because they're interesting uh -huh. at some level, and they have nothing to do with the actual topics of discussion that I feel most connected to when it comes to current events and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've, I mean, this is not, this is not a knock on the things you just said. This is a everything I write about and talk about has to do with a certain vision of Christianity and the things that might be interesting to debate when it comes to like God's existence and stuff is not the thing that motivates the worst politicians and the worst leaders in the country. And so for me, it's a question of like, do I care about the Christian apologetics and counter apologetics and philosophy side of things? No, because this is where all the action is at and this is what's motivating people. So I end up focusing on this, even though this stuff is also really interesting. It's not the thing I've, I've like never had a beer with anyone who sat and talked about the free will stuff because it doesn't come up. But I've had plenty of arguments and debates with the people who make religious arguments for doing something. So uh, it's it's not a knock on philosophy because I find it interesting. It's that there is a disconnect between the conversations a lot of people tend to want to have online, especially in atheist circles, versus the actual motivations and the things we I think should be fighting against. Yeah, I don't know. Gotcha. I'm not yeah. dodging the question, but I don't have much to add to this side of the debate. I have plenty to say about this other side. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, that's that's kind of it. So I've always seen Internet infidels doing that, too. Like they have these fantastic papers on philosophy and all these things that especially when I was new to atheism, I found fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And like and it still is. It's just not where my focus is at these days. Yeah, yeah, and that's like another good thing about internet infidels. Like we were like the first uh, major company to uh, promote uh, scholarly and layperson yeah. articles. Like so many of them, all free to the general public. You know, as our co-founder Jeffrey right. J. Louder has stated, and that's real nice because it's like, and then there's debate transcripts. You know, with 
uh, right. atheists versus Christians too. So it's right. like even theists, and it's not just about you know people who have a secular mindset. Even theists can tune in and be like, oh, you know, let's right. see if the evidence of the resurrection is really that good. You know, with the William Lane Craig or Richard Carrier, right? Or so yeah. Yeah, I've been invited to do with some of those William Lane. I've it was a while ago. <laughs> like William Lane Craig's people reached out to do a debate, and it's like I I don't know why you found me in particular. I don't do those debates. I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> like he, Dillahunt, there are plenty of atheists who enjoy them and do them well. I do not care. That's yeah. not my thing. And I and I say no to all those debate requests. Yeah, yeah. Matt Dillahunty's cool because like he, he like he always thinks outside of the box. Like it's cool because like even when sometimes his evidence isn't that convincing, like just the way he thinks outside of the box and just knows uh, how to like formulate the best questions, like that kind of gives him an advantage, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. So I always like that. And about when you're when you do it day in and day out and you really get a sense of I know how people respond to these questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. I already know how you're gonna respond to this because they genuinely, I mean, in those debates, people genuinely think you're, you're going to, you're offering an argument they've never heard before. Yeah. But if you're good at it um, and you spend week after week talking to people about this stuff, of course, you know what the arguments are going to be and you can anticipate them, you can rebut them. And so, yeah, like that's the thing about the debates. Like, oh, you want to have a debate? Talk to the people who think about this stuff all the time because it's not the thing I focus on. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Alrighty, yeah, and then uh, just to give a final uh, thought before we close out, um, how's Only Sky? And uh, yeah, because I've inter yeah I've interviewed. Let's see here, I've interviewed you, so I've interviewed uh, Bob Seidensticker, Jonathan M S Pierce, Monica L Miller, uh, Dale uh, McGowan, who's your chief content officer. And I think maybe one more person. Yeah, so I've interviewed yeah. a lot of you guys, and they and uh, or oh, and G uh, Dr. Gina Jorgensen, and um, so yeah, how do you like working for the company? It's great. Um, it's an interesting experiment, and I'm genuinely I'm curious to see how it's going to work because the whole premise here is this is not a advertisement for atheism, which I think it's easy to pigeonhole this site as because yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of the blog, a lot of the blog networks, ones that I've been a part of, ones that exist, it's very much a we're championing atheism in our various ways, and I like that personally. Only Sky is very much a, there are so many more millions of people out there who might be atheists, but they're probably just dissatisfied with organized religion or they're oh, apathetic yeah, yeah. toward religion. And what if you had news outlets that offered opinion and commentary and reactions to news stories, but from a secular basis where it's, I'm not here to, con I mean, at least me personally, I am not here to convince you to become an atheist. I'm here to say I'm an atheist. Here's what's wrong with this story because I'm not giving any credibility to religious arguments for this stuff. Um, and sometimes you see a lot of the mainstream news outlets, they treat religion as like a legitimate, honest position. And there's a difference between offering objective journalism in that sense, but treating religion as like a default good or treating it as something that, yeah, everyone believes it. Let's start from there. And saying, no, this person is lying to you. They're contradicting their religion when they do it. They're using their religion to hurt you. And we're not ashamed of saying that. We're not afraid of saying that. And by the way, here's the other thing. Atheism goes for so many of us who grew up in an age where <clears throat> we were trying to convince ourselves God didn't exist. I'm telling you, I'm already there. I don't need any more convincing. So now the question is, well, now what? Where yeah, do you yeah. take well, that? What do you do with that? And what I like about Only Sky is there are so many like dozens of contributors who are saying, here is how I look at the world from a secular perspective. And they're coming from all over the place, whether it's philosophy or talking about, I don't know, sex work or philosophy or politics, politics or yeah, music yeah, yeah. Legal, or stuff. music. And here's why this inspires me in a way God doesn't. Um, and it just it has something to offer that I have not seen um, much of online it, in small doses, sure, here and there, but um, it's just starting. It's only been, I think, uh, a couple of months since it launched. Yeah. And so, the, you know, everyone's kind of get feeling it out, getting their bearings. We're working out of glitches behind the scenes, um, but it's only going to get better. So the question is, where does it go from there? Um, I, I've been super excited about 
um, the way it's been promoted, the way articles are appearing to people who might not go looking for them, that's a huge deal where people might find these articles that never searched for atheism or anything like that. That's a big part of this. So we'll see. We'll see how many people we can reach in time. Yeah, that's awesome. All righty. Well, thank you for that interview. Uh, there was a pretty, I mean, even for just two questions, I was pretty exhausted. <laughs> almost at the 25 minute mark. So that was pretty yeah, good. Right. So thanks for making time out of your day today. Of and, course. Yeah. And then to close off, uh, did you just want to, do you have any like books or anything you want to promote or any websites? You can tell sure. people how to reach you and stuff. Um, go to only sky media, check out everything that's there. If you are on YouTube right now, search for friendly atheist, subscribe to the channel. Uh, I would appreciate that. And if anyone's curious, my name is down here somewhere, but, uh, it I'm at Hemant meta on Twitter. If you want to reach me that way. Awesome. Sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot. He meant. And then, uh, sure. in a couple of minutes, I will give you the uploaded link on YouTube to this so you can share it around if you want, you'd like. Sounds good. All right, Thanks, thank Edward. you.